Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Ask a Property Manager. This is episode number 99 and today is December 1st, 2021. We're coming to you from Studio 2.0 here at Own Buffalo. I'm Andrew Schultz, Principal Broker of Own Buffalo, Inc. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about the hazards of electric space heaters, which ones are the best, um, as well as talking about Zillow coming under fire from multiple uh, shareholder lawsuits. We're going to talk about some questions from housing providers around the country and so much more. But before we jump into all that, we are going to go ahead and plug our social media. New episodes of Ask a Property Manager every Wednesday, 10 a.m. Eastern on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, you can also catch content on Instagram that we don't post on the other two platforms. Last but not least, don't forget about the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast. A new episode of the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast drops tomorrow. We're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be taking a look at, excuse me, best practices when hiring new contractors, tenants who renovate your home without your permission. And that's an interesting one because they did a substantial renovation. Uh, and how to spot fake, fake pay stubs when you're doing tenant screening. So very good episode of the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast. That's available starting tomorrow. Anywhere podcasts are heard or over at rentprep.com slash podcast. Don't miss out on that. We're going to go ahead and jump right into our news of the day here, starting with this article from Housing Wire. Zillow hit with multiple shareholder lawsuits. Zillow's Chief Operating Officer Jeremy Waxman virtually appeared this September at a conference held by investment banking company Piper Sandler and proclaimed the strength and appeal of Zillow offers just continues to grow and we're even more confident now that this is going to be a service really in all weather markets. And what we're talking about here is Zillow's iBuyer program where they would make an offer and purchase your home um, without you having to go through the process of listing it on the market. Six weeks after the remarks, Zillow said it was winding down an iBuyer program responsible for the majority of the company's revenue and operating expenses. Zillow CEO Rich Barton stated Zillow's offers pricing forecast model was just too volatile. A pair of lawsuits on behalf of Zillow investors cite this statement by Waxman and similar rosy claims in 2021 by Barton and Alan Parker, uh, the company's chief financial officer, as illegally misleading investors. Shareholders routinely file lawsuits if a company's stock price plunges, and these cases are no different. Zillow had a market value of $48 billion on February 10th. Following a company earnings report, its market cap was $13.8 billion at the close of the NASDAQ trading this Monday. Uh, but the Zillow lawsuits raised the question of whether executives' upbeat pronouncements were not mere self-promotion, but materially false and or misleading statements in violation of the federal, excuse me, the federal Securities Exchange Act. Zillow's not yet replied to, filed a reply to the cases, and the company declined to comment on them besides a statement that we are aware of the lawsuits filed recently and we are currently reviewing them. As a general practice, we do not discuss pending litigation. The first shareholder lawsuit was lodged November 16th in federal court in Seattle on behalf of Debakar Barua, I hope I pronounced that right, and the proposed class action does not describe who Barua is other than someone who purchased or otherwise acquired Zillow Securities between February 10th, 2021 and November 2nd, 2021. Besides the company, Barton, Parker, and Waxman are each named as co-defendants. Statements like those from Bartner, Barton repeatedly calling Zillow offers a durable service created in the market an unrealistically positive assessment of the company and its financial well-being and prospects, thus causing the company's securities to be overvalued, the lawsuit reads. The Barua case has been assigned to Thomas Zilli, the judge presiding over the real estate brokerage Rex's lawsuit against Zillow, as well as the National Association of Realtors. The second lawsuit was filed November 19th in Seattle Federal Court on behalf of Zillow investor Steve Silverberg. The Silverberg lawsuit also proposes a class action to collect monetary damage on behalf of the plaintiffs who bought Zillow stock between February 10th and November 12th. Other lawyers, meanwhile, are on the hunt to find a plaintiff so they can file a lawsuit of their own against Zillow. A New York law firm, Bragger, Eagle & Squire, fired off a press release Monday that encourages investors to contact the firm. Besides lawsuits, Zillow is also contending with TRC Capital Investment Corporation, a Canadian company that on Monday offered to buy up 2 million shares of Zillow's Class C capital stock for 55 bucks a share. Uh, the offer to Zillow shareholders stands until December 15th, TRC Capital announced and it is known as a mini tender offer. A tender offer is when a shareholder is when shareholders are solicited to sell their stock at a certain price during a particular time window. A mini tender offer is when the soliciting investor looks to buy less than 5% of the company's shares. The SEC warns that a mini tender offer 
triggers little regulatory scrutiny, with a 2008 SEC note stating some bidders make mini tender offers at below market prices, hoping that they will catch investors off guard. Zillow stock was actually trading at $54.26, or a hair less than $55 a share at close of business Monday. Invoking the SEC language, Zillow advised its shareholders to reject TRC Capital's solicitation. A TRC Capital mini-tender offer appears common for companies in transition. A similar ask was made of Snap shareholders earlier this month as the social media company's stock price tumbled. GE also told its investors to reject a TRC Capital mini-tender in early November, five weeks later, GE announced a split of its operations into three separate companies. So I do think it's interesting that they are calling out specifically some statements that were made. Uh, I believe this was the, uh, the item of note here. I think that it's interesting that they're calling out the statements that these people are making and saying that they're artificially manipulating these, these stock prices uh, because we've seen the same thing with Tesla and Elon Musk, and it's been literally a tweet. It hasn't even been a spoken statement, but a written tweet has caused massive shifts in markets. And as a result, it does create questions in the market as to um, whether or not people should be making these statements and, and making misleading statements or whether something is false or misleading or however you want to look at it. Uh, but it's interesting to me that based on the statements that people are making, that's where at least one of these lawsuits is coming from. Uh, I don't think it comes to anybody's shock that Zillow's iBuyer program is coming to a close. I mean, just looking at the Zestimate program, we know that Zestimate's not terribly accurate. It's only as good as the information obtainable by Zillow. I'm not going to lie, Zillow has access to a ton of market data, um, but by the same token, they're a multi-billion dollar corporation that could not make an iBuyer program work. Um, they lack the local knowledge in each individual market, and I think that that is really where they went wrong. I have heard multiple stories of people selling homes to Zillow for way more than what the market would bear. Um, and these are not homes that are necessarily in top tier condition. These are homes that need a bunch of work and things like that. So Zillow is immediately behind the eight ball buying something over market price and then having to dump a bunch of cash back into it. So it'll be interesting to see how this all pans out over the next few months as Zillow drops these properties. I know we talked about it last week. I think they had 7,000 properties or something like that that they need to dump um, to get uh, to get these properties back off their books. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the market as those homes re-enter the market and how big of a bath Zillow really winds up taking on this whole thing. We're gonna jump over to our next article on uh, CNBC. And this one talks about warehouses taking over the United States. A little bit more commercial feel on this article, but I think it's relevant, especially given the fact that we're post Thanksgiving and we just had Black Friday and now we're starting to think about holidays and presents and everything else. Um, for every Cyber Monday purchase, there's a warehouse employee packing up those soon to be presents. The big online shopping holiday comes amid a warehouse shortage across the United States as distribution center vacancy rates are at all time lows. Nearly 96% of, an, of existing industrial space is in use, according to commercial real estate co services company JLL. The US may need an additional 1 billion square feet of new industrial space by 2025 to keep up with demand, JLL estimates. Uh, the industry is effectively sold out through next year. Chris Catton, managing director of global strategy and analytics at Prologis told CNBC. Rents are at all-time highs, and pre-leasing rates have skyrocketed, which is when warehouses are leased before construction is even complete. The leasing volume is almost triple, in some cases, to what's being built every year. Um, Metab Randhawa, a senior director of industrial research for the Americas at JLL, told CNBC. For example, another nearly 190 million square foot of warehousing space was under construction in North America during 2020, and more than 43% of the buildings were pre-leased, according to CBRE. The demand is driven by retailers beefing up e-commerce operations amid the online shopping boom and investing in faster delivery thanks to consumer expectations. Retailers are also securing more storage space in the U.S. to mitigate the impact of future supply chain shocks like those caused by the coronavirus pandemic. That is an interesting point. I think I'll go ahead and highlight that. Plus, e-commerce and logistics takes up three times as much space as brick and mortar retail. That I highlighted simply because I thought it was an interesting statistic. I didn't realize that e-commerce takes up that much more space than traditional brick and mortar. But I guess when you're holding that much more inventory, need that much more room for pick and pack, need that much more room for trucks and things like that, I mean, you, you, I don't know how many bays an average Walmart or a grocery store or whatever has for truck delivery, but I would say probably two, three, four. 
versus a warehouse is probably going to have 20, 30, 40. Um, so I guess it makes sense that the warehousing does take up so much more space than traditional brick and mortar retail. Uh, I'm just thinking of it from like a Walmart to an Amazon warehouse perspective. Uh, the expansion of warehousing has shifted local economies like in Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania. The rapid growth has created controversy over land use because the warehouse boom is tightening the supply of land. Our folks are very upset about the warehouses and they're very upset about the truck traffic that it's creating. Northampton County Executive Lamont McClure told CNBC. That's pushing industrial developers to get creative and find more unconventional spots like a Lehigh Valley Aqua Park and Scuba Diving Center if they want to keep building. Lehigh Valley native Stuart Schooley told CNBC that he and some friends tried to stop the construction of the first warehouse on their street. We realized we couldn't stop it and then it just started a progression of one warehouse after another. We were the last property. Schooley, owner of Dutch Springs, a diving center and aqua park in Levi Valley, told CNBC. Now Shuley's selling the land so he and his wife Jean can, uh, excuse me, Jane can retire. Real estate developer Trammell Crow is purchasing the property and looking to build two warehouses on the land. Trammell Crow is the development arm of Amazon. I don't know if they're like an own subsidiary or not, but Trammell Crow does all of the warehouse development for Amazon. Uh, they've done most of the warehouse development here in the Western New York region. I think that that's their national arm that does development of warehousing space. Uh, we used to be quite welcome, and the worm has definitely turned, especially in places like Lehigh Valley, where I think people feel like, when is enough enough, said Andrew Meal, managing director in Trammel Crow's Northeast Metro Division. Um, so what do all these warehouses mean for American consumers and business people from Wall Street to Main Street, blah, blah, blah. It goes on to a video. We're not going to jump into all that. But I did want to highlight this because we are talking about a shift in the use of land. We're talking about a shift in how consumers shop, how consumers consume, uh, you know, on demand, bring it to my door is more and more important to people nowadays, especially, and I think it really ramped up as a result of the pandemic. Uh, but it's interesting to see just how short of warehouse space we are. I know that in the Western New York region, we've been short of warehouse space for several years now. There's been a big push for more uh, investment in warehouse space and things of that nature. Um, but I did not realize just how bad it was. I mean, when you have 43% of the existing buildings, I'm sorry, excuse me, 43% of the buildings that are already under construction pre-leased, that is a very, very strong indicator that warehousing is going to be a strong, strong, strong market for many years to come. So if you're in a spot where you're thinking about trying to get out of residential real estate, maybe start looking at warehouse real estate, maybe through something like a REIT or whatever, if you can't buy and build, buy or build a warehouse yourself, you know, something like a, a REIT that specializes in warehousing and storage might be something that would be worthwhile for you to look at as an investment. Obviously, do your own research. I'm not providing financial advice here, um, but I think that warehousing is going to be huge over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Go ahead and look at some funny stuff. How about that? We'll start with this one. I don't, I don't know who hired this contractor, but uh, they should probably, probably look at a new contractor. Um, and actually, a shameless plug, what I just mentioned the, the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast earlier in the episode. We're talking about hiring vendors in, in this week's episode. This is how you avoid situations like that. So go ahead and listen to that episode when you get an opportunity. Um, I don't remember where I picked this one up. It's been in my, my memes folder for a little while now, but I thought that this one was funny, especially as we come into the holiday season here. So don't skip your home inspections. Always make sure that you get a home inspection on your transaction. Don't skip your home inspection. It's the silliest idea out there. Ask any home inspector or any real estate agent or broker worth their weight in salt and they'll tell you the exact same thing. We are gonna go ahead and jump to our questions from housing providers around the country here, starting with this one on telling a tenant that you are selling the property. Uh, our contract is up on one of our rentals. We spoke with the tenants at the end of October and they are wanting to renew. No issue there at the time we were wanting them to renew. However, my husband has decided he wants to sell the property uh, to make triple what we have in it. How do we go about doing this? How would you do this? Uh, we haven't raised the rent on the tenants in the past four years, and now with insurance and everything going higher than it was, it's not cash flowing how it should. Also, the contract, I assume the lease contract, has not yet been signed. I'm all in favor of making money, but I don't want to be a jerk to our renters either. Do you have any advice? So the first thing you're going to want to do here is figure out your timeline. When do you want to sell this property? Is this a situation where you don't necessarily need to sell it this second and you can give these tenants a little bit of time? Um, and that would be the next step would be starting this off or having a conversation with the tenants um, because they're certainly not expecting this move. 
The question doesn't state what area you're in, but I mean, I'm in the Northeast and it's cold now. It's winter time. It's December 1st, you know, it's, it's cold here. So telling a tenant that they have to move in the middle of winter might not be um, the greatest thing, especially like if you said, as you said, the tenants are good tenants, um, you just, you wanna sell the house. So my recommendation would be if you have the ability to give them some time to get out of the property, uh, and some time to find a place, do that. Give them the opportunity to find a place. Don't just boot them. The lease is not signed, so they would be month to month at this point by the sounds of it. Uh, in certain states, you will have restrictions as to how much notice that you have to give, um, like a minimum amount of notice you have to give. Here in New York, it's 30, 60, 90 days. 30 days for one year or less, 60 days for one to two years, 90 days for two years plus. Uh, some states also have laws that prevent you from terminating a month-to-month -month tenancy unless it's for a specific reason. Um, different states have different laws on that. I don't believe New York has that law in place yet, but you're going to want to go ahead and check that out as well since you did not mention what state you're in uh, where the rental is. My recommendation would be if you're going to list this property for sale, wait until the tenants are out of the property uh, and list it once it's vacant. That gives you an opportunity to go in do some light cleaning, make any small repairs that you need to do to try to maximize your sale price. The other thing this does is makes it much easier to sell the property. People are going to be able to come and go look at the property whenever they want to because it'll be vacant. They're not going to have to coordinate with tenants. You're not going to have tenants potentially saying things to buyers that would turn them off from the property, you know, all sorts of things. Um, my recommendation would be if you're in a position where you can give these tenants some time to move, give them that time and then put the property on the market once it's vacant. You're to be in a much better position if you go that route. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, and we've talked about this before on the show, is you mentioned that you didn't raise the rent for the past four years. Now insurance is higher, taxes are higher, everything is higher, and the property's not cash flowing the way that it should. The reason the property's not cash flowing the way it should is because you're not managing the property correctly. Rents need to go up every single year because the expenses go up every single year. And when you start skipping years, you wind up in situations like what you're in right now where the property was doing great four years ago and now the property's barely performing because you haven't kept up with market conditions. So just to reiterate, make sure that you are reviewing and raising your rents every single year to make sure that you're keeping up with the market conditions and make sure that you're staying in line with where you should be. You never know when a state is going to put in some sort of a legislation that would prevent you from raising rents more than X percent per year or something like that. So being as close to market rent is critical to making sure that your asset can perform on the long-term basis. So don't, don't skip stuff like that. Stay on top of that sort of thing. Electric space heater hazards. So I tried plugging, uh, I tried to unplug this space heater last night and the plug would not come out. I was using two hands. Finally, I yanked it out and saw that the outlet and plug looked like this. What happened? The space heater was working, but I plan on throwing it out to be safe. Can I simply replace this outlet and get a new space heater? Thanks in advance. We're gonna go ahead and take a look at the picture. You can see here the scorched outlet. You can also see the melt on the cord of the space heater and also the space heater itself. So there's a couple things that I wanna talk about here. You were pretty close to having a much more serious situation on your hands. Uh, and the reason I say that is because we've had situations like this in the past and it's a good thing that you caught it in time. Um, my recommendation is call an electrician, have them come out and test that circuit to see if there's something that's shorting out at any point along the way in the circuit. Um, you could have a number of, res of, of issues here that you're not aware of. You could have, it could be a loose wire. It could be uh, an undersized wire. So you're getting too much heat through the line, which is causing the issues that you're seeing. You could have an undersized breaker, which would probably cause it to trip. Um, you obviously have a bad outlet there at this point. So, you know, you have multiple issues that could be, that could be a factor on this, on this line. My recommendation would be have an electrician come out, test the line, make sure everything is safe. Obviously replace that outlet, make sure that the breaker or anything that needs to be replaced is taken care of at the same time, uh, because you don't want to wind up in a situation like this and wind up burning your damn house down. Nobody wants that. Um, at a minimum, you need a new outlet and you need a new space heater. Um, if this space heater is going to be a regular use item in your room or in that home, um, you may even wanna consider having an electrician run a dedicated circuit specifically for that space heater. Space heaters do use a large amount of electric. They draw almost the same wattage in a lot of instances as what a 
microwave wood. Um, and microwaves are not a low voltage appliance. I mean, or a, a low wattage appliance. They draw a ton of wattage. Uh, I'm going to show the picture again of that space heater because I want to talk about the type of space heater real quick. And then I'm going to give a, a recommendation for what we use. Um, the space heater there in the picture looks to be a ceramic cube type space heater that just has an electric element inside that tries to heat the, excuse me, tries to heat the ceramic plate um, and just radiates heat. No blower or anything like that, it doesn't look like. There might be a blower on that one, actually, now that I'm looking at the buttons on top of it. Um, but no matter what, I, I never recommend that style of space heater. I personally don't like exposed metal uh, electrical elements on space heaters. I find that to be incredibly hazardous. Um, anytime I see a space heater like that, my first thought is I want to unplug it right now. Uh, and it looks like you tried and had a little bit of problem doing that. So I'm going to jump over to the Home Depot website here, and I'm going to show you the style of space heater that I recommend. Uh, this is the type of space heater that we keep in stock in our office so that, as a matter of fact, I have one behind me right now. Um, I'm going to actually show you. I literally have one, oops, pulling on my mic, literally have one in my office right now in case we need to take it and deploy it someplace. It's just tucked here next to my desk. Uh, and it's actually the same brand that's on the website here. Give me one second. Sorry about that, I had to adjust my mic. So this type of space heater, I recommend this type of space heater for one main reason. It's an oil-filled space heater, um, but it's sealed, and it has basically an electrical element in it that heats up the oil, and then the oil radiates heat out into the room. You don't have to refill it. It's not burning the oil or anything like that. It's just basically using that oil as um, a natural way to heat the fins of the radiator and then release that heat out into the room. I also like these space heaters because they have a tip sensor on them. So if they get tipped over, they immediately shut off. They do have some variable uh, controls as far as temperature and things of that nature. They're pretty compact. They uh, come on wheels so you can move them around a room. They're, in terms of space heaters, I feel most safe with this style of space heater versus pretty much any of the other space heaters out there and definitely safer than that thing right there. Um, those things, in my opinion, are a bigger hazard than anything else. Keep in mind that just because a store sells something doesn't mean it's a good idea to buy it. You know, sometimes products just suck. Like sometimes products are not great and I kind of put those space heaters in that category. I would much prefer to see something like this. If you've got to use a space heater, um, you know, if you've got a situation where uh, your furnace is out and you have to provide temporary heat until you can get a part, this is the type of space heater that I would recommend um, in those instances. So that being said, we'll jump back to the question here. All of that being said, um, your lease should state that um, your lease should state that you do not permit space heaters in your units. The reason I say that is because tenants have a tendency not to understand the electrical systems of a house and could put you in a situation where you overload a circuit, just like what you're looking at right there. My recommendation is put into your lease that you do not allow space heaters. And when you're doing your quarterly or monthly, excuse me, your quarterly or annually inspections, um, check to make sure that they don't have space heaters plugged in. If you see a space heater plugged in, ask the tenant what the issue is. Maybe they're getting not enough heat in that room. They might have a balancing issue or whatever. Something, there's a reason that they're running a space heater. Um, and it's, it's certainly not because it's the most efficient way of heating their property. So um, my recommendation is don't allow tenants to run space heaters. If you do have to run space heaters in certain rooms, uh, you may wanna look into having dedicated circuits for those space heaters. And above all else, make sure that you're using a space heater that's not going to be a gigantic hazard. Um, get an electrician out there to check over the electrical in your property and good luck to you. I'm very, very glad that you did not lose your home. Uh, on to our third and final question of the day, renting a home with basement bedrooms. Happy Thanksgiving, anyone. Should I wait to rent out the house if I know my prospective tenants would like to use the basement bedrooms for sleeping? Two bedroom ranch with a two bedroom needs egress windows, walkout basement, under contract to close on it in December. It's in a winter climate and it's, so it's not ideal or economical to dig out the new egress windows for the basement right now. Um, do not rent out a home where basement rooms are going to be used as bedrooms unless those rooms meet code, unless those rooms have proper egress windows or egress doors, uh, unless those rooms have proper smoke and CO detectors, etc. 
Don't risk your tenant's life for a little bit of cash. It is the absolute stupidest play that you can make. Don't do it. Um, now you do mention that there is a walkout basement, which says to me that there's a full-size door somewhere in this basement that allows people to walk out to grade. Um, based on that, my recommendation is talk to your local code enforcement officer and see if that door does or does not allow you to use these rooms in the basement as bedrooms. Talk to the code enforcement officer because they're going to be able to give you the clearest answer as to whether or not you're in the clear or whether or not you need to make some modifications or whether or not these rooms can just not be used as bedrooms. My understanding of the building code from when we did our basement rehab recently is that the egress window or door needs to be in the room where egress would be necessary. So in this instance, it needs to be in the bedroom. You have to have those windows in the bedroom, even if you have a door right outside the bedroom in a hallway or something like that, a lot of times that won't classify as proper egress. You have to have the egress window or door in the bedroom itself. So you're gonna to have to talk to someone um, at the code enforcement department to see what you can and can't do here. Do not risk your tenant's life for a little bit of cash if you're not properly set up for basement bedrooms. Um, just don't do it. It's just a, the, the, it's a, the worst possible idea that you could possibly jump into. Um, if you are going to rent to this tenant, understand that they've already exposed the fact that they want to use the two basement rooms as bedrooms. Your lease needs to specifically state that all basement rooms are for storage purposes only and that they cannot be used for living purposes, bedrooms, anything like that. Uh, I'm also going to recommend that you regularly inspect that to make sure that tenants aren't using the rooms as bedrooms, considering the fact that they've already told you what their intent is. Um, last but not least, you can always modify your lease after the fact. If you put these egress windows in, you can modify the lease down the road with these tenants to say, okay, these rooms can now be used as bedrooms because they meet the qualifications. Uh, but really, I think you're taking a very, very, very large risk here by putting tenants into a unit that you already know doesn't necessarily meet their needs as it sits right now, where you know that they're going to be pushing the legal limits of the property and putting you in a potential situation where if someone is to get hurt, you could be held potentially liable. Do not rent basement bedrooms without proper egress. I don't think I can make it any clearer than that. Hopefully that one sunk in. Thank you all so much for watching. That pretty much wraps things up for this week's episode. We love producing Ask a Property Manager and you can definitely help us to improve by dropping a question in the comments, either here on Facebook or over on YouTube, and your question may be picked up and answered in an upcoming episode. If you enjoyed this content or if I brought some value to your day, do me a favor and hit that thumbs up button. YouTube and Facebook both push videos based on community feedback, so every like, comment, subscribe, and share helps us to grow and reach more people. We'll be back next week, December 8th. That's next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Eastern with another show you won't want to miss. Thank you all so much for watching and we'll see you next week.